Hello and welcome to episode 51 of the Frogbit Blog Podcast. Um, we ain't got Len this week, he was busy, but I've got all my usual features and I talk about death and funerals. Um, listen up, eh? Right then, um, I'm going to start off with funerals this episode. Um, I appreciate it's not always a good way to woo an audience, so but I'm going to do it anyway because it's important. Um, if you remember last episode, I was talking about the death of a young friend of mine, um, Ewan Brown. Well, last week um, was his funeral, and it was incredibly moving. It was sad. It was poignant. But also at the, t- the same time, it was an absolutely amazing event attended by lots of very special people. People. And there was a humanist service in the local village hall, and then Ewan was taken to a woodland burial site to be buried. Now, I actually fancied one of these myself, but it was the first time I've ever been to one and seen it in action, and I must say that I was very impressed. Um, this was a huge field in the Northumberland countryside, and it was a beautiful sunny day too, which really helped. Um, and as these things are quite new, the trees are only small, um, and there's only a few dotted around a very large area, so it does doesn't much look like a, a woodland at the moment. But there was a wicker archway that led onto the field. Um, the field was mostly long grass with the path- pathway cut through it for a funeral procession. Um, the coffin was made of leaves, um, though it m- looked more like a sort of wicker thing. And it was pulled on the back of a small horse-drawn cart to the grave um, where the humanist person um, said the, their final bit. Um, and it was also poignant as we stood there in silence uh, and a skylark flew overhead chirping a way and it was quite incredible it was amazing and sad and all those um all those things it was really beautiful anyway for all you eco-friendly people consider this as an option um Right, while we're on the subject, there was a little a video, um, a little video that appeared online with the headline, Ant brings flower petals to cover dead bumblebee in what looks like a funeral. Yeah, bit of projection there, but there you go. Saw this outside of my work by the garden. There was a dead bumblebee and we were watching the ants bring flower petals and leave them around the bumblebee. It looked like they were having a funeral for it, she wrote on Facebook. Well, probably not. Um, You know, there's reasons why ants do this sort of behaviour. They've been observed before building sort of walls around sugary spills and around any dead animal that they find with rocks and stones because the the wall of petals would not only prevent the ants from other colonies from smelling the food and alerting their colonies, but it also acts as a road sign for the colony as to where where to find the food. And it also allows the ants to harvest their find in more manageable pieces so not really um, a funeral there more of a bee takeaway but it was kind of cute wasn't it and here's another one um, about funerals. Uh, this one, I must admit, really did piss me off. Um, and this is what it says. The unusual death of a woman's dog in Virginia, America, has sparked an outcry and a deba- debate of whether it's OK to kill a healthy pet and bury it with its owner, according to their dying wish. Emma, a Shih Tzu mix, that's the dog, not the owner, was euthanised and cremated in March as per its owner's will. The dog was put down despite the efforts of animal shelter workers who spent two weeks trying to talk the executor of the woman's estate out of the plan. Emma was reportedly taken to a vet, put down and then taken to a pet cremation centre in Richmond, Virginia and the ashes given to the executor in an urn for exec- executor, not the executor. Though actually, I think executor is more appropriate there, isn't it? The ashes were given to the executor in an urn for burial. That's a good Freudian slip, wasn't it? We did suggest that they could sign the dog over on numerous occasions because it's a dog we could easily find a home for and a rehome, said Carrie Jones, manager of the um, Chesterfield Animal Service. And what a horrible thing to do. It's like saying, well, I'm dead. Why the fuck should you go on living, Emma? Um, yeah, horrible, really, but there you go. From Big Blog. Right, and while we're on the subject of death and dying, there's been a new survey out and more than 90% of the UK population believe um, assisting dying should be legalised for those suffering from terminal illnesses. 
um, according to a latest opinion poll. And the Channel um, Island of Jersey has just launched a review on to whether, introduce, whether to introduce assisted dying le legislation. And I've talked about this before. Um, Providing medical assistance to end a life is legal in Belgium, Canada, Colombia, Holland, Luxembourg, Switzerland and seven United, um, US states. And the UK Assisted Dying Coalition has collected figures showing that more than one person a week now travel from Britain to Switzerland to end their life. One person a week has to go to a, abroad to die. And there's been a couple of sort of big cases. Um, there's been a legal challenge, um, and one of them was um, for a, a bloke called Noel Conway, who's a retired lecturer who is paralysed from the neck down by progressive motor neurone disease and who's slowly dying and who wants to be able to end his own life in his own time. And the previous month was a father of three, um, identified only as Omid T, who was su suffering from severe neurodegenerative condition, and he'd travelled to a Swiss clinic to end his life. Um, five days after he died, um, the High Court ruled against his legal um, challenge. Because the other thing is about this, is um, helping someone to kill themselves is a criminal offence that carries a maximum sentence of 14 years and euthanasia is considered murder under UK law. And now 90% of, of the population believe that um, people should be allowed um, to, you know, we should be allowed assisted dying if people choose. Now, obviously, there's got to be certain, there's got to be certain rules. And I've talked about this before. There's no reason why little courts couldn't be set up. And if someone wanted to go through the assisted dying process, they could be um, reviewed by a, a judge and a couple of doctors just to, just to stop this idea that, oh, old people will feel obliged to kill themselves when they come a burden. Well, we could make sure that that didn't happen. We could introduce, like I said, some sort of legislation, some sort of courts where it had to be reviewed by a couple of people to stop things like that happening. But surely the time has come, and 90% of the British population have it, where if you're dying a slow, agonising, painful death, you choose your time of death, your place of death with your family around you, and that kind of thing. And I think it's something that we need to push our goals government to act upon. Is it okay to talk about drugs? Is it okay to do it anyway? Is it okay? Right, in the last episode of Is It Okay to Talk About Drugs, I talked about coked up shrimps. Well, shrimps that um, ingested cocaine and um, ketamine. Yeah, because there was so much of it in the water. So it was where drugs meet nature, which is interesting, really, isn't it, for, for my kind of show? I do about drugs, I do about nature, and about drugs where drugs meet nature. And this week I've got something in a similar vein. Is it OK to talk about things in similar veins when you're talking about drugs? Anyway, carry on. Um, no, drugs and nature again. A parrot has been taken into custody in northern Brazil following a police raid targeting crack dealers. According to the reports, the bird had been taught to alert criminals to police operations in Villa Irma Dulce in the sun scorched capital of the Piu state by shouting, Mum, the police! Yeah. The parrot, who has not been named, was seized on Monday afternoon when officers swooped on a drug den run by a local couple. What's a drug den? A den, anyway. He must have been trained for this, said one officer in the operation, said of the two-wing wrongdoer. As soon as the police got close, he started shouting. A Brazilian journalist who came face to face with the imprisoned parrot on Tuesday described it as super obedient creature, albeit one that has kept its beak firmly shut after being arrested. So far, it hasn't made a sound completely silent. The reporter said, Alexandra Clark, a local vet, confirmed that the parrot had not cooperated. Lots of police officers had come by and he said nothing. I mean, what did they expect it to do? Sort of own up to all the drug deals its owners have been doing. Anyway, the brilliant broadcaster Globo said that Papagaio do Tráfico which um, is drug trafficking parrot in Brazil. And um, that's a good name for a band, isn't it? Papagaio do Tráfico. Anyway, it had been handed over to the local zoo where it would spend three months learning to fly before being released. Oh, that's quite... So it's a nice ending for the parrot. Anyway, the bird joins a growing list of animals implicated in Brazil's drug trade, although most have been reptiles, as apparently in 2008... 
Police seized two small alligators during a raid on a favela in western Rio de Janeiro, claiming local gangsters had fed their enemies to the animals. However, the father of one of the gangs well, of one of the accused gangsters rejected those accusations, alleging his son's gang had once tried to do so, but the alligator had refused to eat the corpse. Oh, what a lovely story. Is it okay? Right, um, a couple of episodes ago, I was looking at things that Britain uh, was good at, and one of them was food banks. Well, there's another one. We're top of the charts again. It turns out we're good at something, and this time it's poverty. Yep. Um, according to a UN report by Philip Alston um, on extreme poverty and human rights, he published a report on the state of Britain on Wednesday, and in it he accused the government of the systematic immiseration of a significant part of the British population. And of course, did ministers agree with it? No, they came back and said, a completely inaccurate picture of, of our approach to tackling poverty and instead claimed that the UK was amongst the happiest countries in the world. So what's being happy got to do with some of the population got to do with the other part being in poverty? And the other thing is, not only are we really good at poverty, we're really good at denying poverty exists. Um, so Alston, this eminent New York-based human rights lawyer, said the government response amounted to a total denial of a set of uncontested facts and that when he first read his public comment, he thought it actually might be a spoof. Yes, um, good on you, Britain. We're good at poverty and we're good at the denial of poverty. From Big Blob. Right, if you remember uh, a few episodes back, I did a bit on the prevalence of anti-gay American preachers and politicians who, by a coincidence, surprise, surprise, turns out that they had gay feelings to hide. Well, it's sort of obvious, isn't it? Oh, oh, the thought of those men having sex with each other and doing things to each other, well, well, it's disgusting. Yeah, and it's you who has the constant mental images of men having sex together. Why would that be, eh? eh? Well... There's finally some proof, so listen on, and this is what the article says. Homophobic attitudes are more likely amongst those who feel same-sex attraction. A study published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology found that homophobic attitudes are more prominent among individuals who experience suppressed or unacknowledged attraction towards others of the same sex. The study consisted of four experiments in the US and Germany and involved roughly 160 college students in each. The results supported the long-held theory that self-identified heterosexuals who represent their same-sex inclinations are more likely to experience greater feelings of fear, aversion and violence towards LGBT people. In many cases, these people who are at war with themselves and they are turning this internal conflict outwards. We laugh and make fun of such blatant reciprocity. Well, that's me, actually, isn't it? Yeah, so sorry about that. Anyway, but in a real way, these people often themselves must be victims of repression and experience exaggerated feelings of threat. Homophobia is not a laughing matter. Yeah? Well, there you go. What a friggin' surprise, eh? Rich people doing good eco things. Rich people doing good eco things. Rich people doing good eco things. It's not where you're from, it's where you're at. And you can't help it if you're a posh rich twat. Right, well, um, we've not actually got rich people doing good eco things today. Well, some of these people might be rich, but that's not the point. Uh, anyway, it's something similar, so listen on. Sikhs around the world are planning to plant a million new trees as a gift to the entire planet. The scheme, titled the Million Tree Project, is being coordinated um, by a Washington, D.C.-based environmental organisation, EcoSeek, and is taking place as part of the celebrations marking 550 years since the birth of the founder of Sikhism, Guru Nanak. 
The project aims to reverse environmental decline and help people reconnect with nature. And since it was launched last month, tens of thousands of trees have already been planted as members of the community embark on the challenge. Um, volunteers are working with environmental specialists in order to, to plant 1,820 forests around the world. Each forest is set to contain several hundred shrubs and trees which will be made up of species native to that particular area. Species, species native to that particular area. As the majority of the world's Sikh population lives in the Punjab, the state of the Punjab in India, every village in the state has committed to planting 550 saplings. However, trees are also popping up in the UK, the US, Australia and Ken Kenya. Rajwat Singh, president of EcoSeek, explains that he wanted to celebrate the anniversary in a significant uh, way. Um, and he said, Guru Nanak was a nature lover. He talked about nature as a manifestation of God and many of his writings talk about how we need to learn the lessons of a life of nature. As Sikhs, our connection to the environment is an integral part of our faith and identity. Future generations will benefit from the fruits of our labour, symbolising peace, friendship and continuity for generations to come. So it's not rich people do doing good eco things, is it? It's more like... Sick people doing good eco things. Sick people doing good eco things. Sick people doing good eco things. Across the world and in the Punjab, your spiritual leader is Karu Nana. Wish this fan would bloody hurry up. I'm freezing. I know, brass monkeys, in it. Oh, here it comes. All right, you slags. All right, All right boss. boss. Where are we off today, boss? Oh, we've got a big job on. We're going down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. The Mariana Trench? Ain't that the deepest place in the ocean? Yeah, it is, you fucking smart ass. Been watching David Attenborough again? Yeah, I did. What are we going for? Are we going to look for as yet undiscovered pieces, species of fish or jellyfish or other types of phytoplankton that can survive extreme pressures? Um, well, no, not exactly, no. Well, what then? Um, we're going litter picking. Litter picking? You're fucking kidding me. Yeah, so the headline from a couple of weeks ago. This was the headline. Man makes deepest ever dive in Mariana Trench and discovers litter. Great. One of the deepest dives ever made by a human inside a, a, a submarine, a Texas investor found something he could have found in the gutter of nearly any street corner in the world. Litter. Victor v Vescovo, a retired naval officer, made the unsettling discovery as he descended nearly 11,000 metres to a point in the Pacific, the specific, <laughs> Pacific Ocean's Mariana Trench. Why does that sound very scouse? It does, doesn't it? The Mariana Trench. We're going for the Mariana Trench for a drink. Anyway, carry on. It's the deepest place on Earth. His expedition said in a statement on Monday his dive went 16 metres lower than the previous deepest descent in the trench in the 60s, 1960s. That took a long time to go a bit deeper, didn't it? Anyway, so, yeah, they go all the way to the deepest part of the deepest bit of the ocean and they find a bit of fucking plastic. Fucking great, eh? It's clever. It's really, really clever. And talking of jellyfish, um, well, I did a few minutes back in the last sketch. You might have missed it, but I did actually mention jellyfish. Um, like all jellyfish, Turritopsis dorni um, begins life as a larva called a planula, which develops from a fertilised egg. A planula, a planula swims at first, then settles on the seafloor and grows into a cylindrical colony of polyps. A good name for a band, cylindrical colony of polyps. These ultimately spawn free-swimming, genetically identical medusae. 
the animals we recognise as jellyfish, which grow to adulthood in a matter of weeks. Fully grown, they're tiny, they're only 0.18 of an inch across, and it says smaller than a pinky nail. I think that means a fingernail, yeah? A bright red stomach is visible in the middle of its transparent belt, and the edges are lined with up to 90 white tentacles. These tiny transparent creatures have an extraordinary survival skill, though. In response to physical damage or even starvation, they take a leap back into their development process, transforming back into a polyp. In a process that looks remarkably like immortality, the born-again polyp colony eventually buds and releases medusae that are identically, genetically identical to the injured adult. In fact, since this phenomenon was first observed in the 90s, the species has come to be known as the immortal jellyfish. The cellular mechanism behind it, a rare process known as transdifferentiation. So you've got a born-again polyp that has immortality and transdifferentiation. It sounds a bit like a bloody religion to me. What do you reckon? Do you think we should start up a jellyfish worshipping cult? Um, and if you don't mind, I'll be the leader and you can also send me your donations, tax-free of course, and I'll buy myself a lot of big houses, cars, yachts, all that kind of thing. Oh no, sorry, I forgot, Christians already do that, don't they? Anyway, I think you'll agree that for Turritopsis Dorney... Oh, Yep, unsafe drinking water, not climate change, is the world's most immediate public health issue, EPA agency administrator Andrew Wheeler said recently. Yeah, because water shortages definitely aren't linked to the weather and climate change, are they, you bunch of knobheads? And yet again, here we have the Trump administration doing everything it can in the name of climate denial. But interestingly, at the same day, a new study showed that removing fossil fuel emissions would increase rainfall by 10 to 70 percent over densely populated regions in India, 10 to 30 percent in China and 10 to 40 percent um, over Central America, West Africa. Yeah. This substantial increase re increased rainfall would result in greater water and food security. Well, there's a friggin' surprise, yep. Um, not only would it increase rainfall, but it would also save millions of lives worldwide because 3.6 million people are dying each year due to outdoor pollution caused by fossil fuels, an international team of researchers estimated. Now, look, there's obviously an issue about water shortage. Um, but climate change is one of the main problems alongside stuff like animal agriculture, especially cows, because they use up so much water to produce um, cow meat, don't they? And bloody Arnie Schwarzenegger has been piping up again. And I used to think he was reactionary. In some ways he is, but he seems to be saying some really good stuff recently. Um, and he's spoken about eating less meat for the environment. And he was accused of drinking vegan Kool-Aid recently by Beef Magazine. Yep, there is an actual magazine out there called Beef Magazine. Sounds like a bag of laughs, doesn't he? Anyway, back to the point I was trying to make. Ar Arnie recently said that the blame for this un un folding catastrophe should be directly square directed squarely at fossil fuel companies and they should be sued for it he said 
Yep, Arnie said early this week he will be suing oil companies for, for knowingly killing people all over the world by suppressing and distorting information about climate change and its consequences and lobbying governments to prevent regulation, all while profiting immensely. Hasta la vista, baby. The oil companies knew from now... Oh, this is an awful Arnie accent, I know, but I can't do it. Anyway, the oil companies knew from 1959 on they did their own study that there would be global warming happening because of fossil fuels and on top of that it would be risky for people's lives that it would kill he said he said that he's consulting private law firms on how best to develop a lawsuit and is spill um, still exploring timeline for a legal action the current regime aren't they they're corrupt and they're intent on destroying the earth to make themselves richer the bastards he didn't say that bit yeah i added that bit so um anyway well done mr schwarzenegger um actually there's a new terminator film out soon at the moment and um, with arnie in it and i wonder if in the last defiant act at the end he smashes up the fuel lobby or something like that anyway that's enough of climate stuff this week so let's hear the jingle again Yep, OK, so it's laugh at the twats time. Look, I know it's not good. I know we have to engage people and we have to understand that people have different opinions to ours. And I'm trying to be more thoughtful. I'm trying to be more open and more caring. But sometimes it is good just to have a section where you can laugh at the twats. And anyway, this week, fury after Morrison's wouldn't sell couple meat pies before 9am. And the article says the meat pies were in within sniffing distance, but staff told Linda and Tony Gilks... 8:45 a.m. that they could not be sold for another 15 minutes. It should have been a simple case of pie and sell. But Linda and Tony Gilts were left piping hot with fury after their local Morrisons refused to sell them meat pies before 9 a.m. I wanted eight large sausage rolls and two steak bakes, said Linda, 62, from Thorntree. It was 8:45 a.m. and there were no pies at all displayed. I could see back bags and bags of pies all wrapped up in cages on the counter. They were caged behind the counter. The trolleys were ready to be pushed out. But when I asked for the pies, I was told, we can't sell the pies until 9am. I could have a fruit pie and not a meat pie. And a queue of five other confused customers formed at the oven fresh counter in Buick Hills, Morrison, to demand their pastry fix. Where staff were determined to abide the, by the pie rules, telling customers the store had a new no meat pies before 9 a.m. policy. Oh, and I bet every single one of them was a fucking Nigel Farage supporter. <laughs> Unwrap the twat, tell it like it is. Unwrap the twat, tell it like it is. My mind unravels like a toilet bowl.
Right, um, I want to talk about Paul Stamets. I mentioned this fella a while back and I did a short article on how he discovered a fungus that may help um, give bees help in combating um, colony collapse. And I didn't realise it at the time, but he is Mr Mushroom. He's one of the world's foremost experts on mushrooms and fungus. Um, and I've been listening to him on Bioneers and also he's on a Joe Rogan podcast. And these are some of the amazing things he says about mushrooms. 23 primates consume mushrooms. Yeah, 23. We're one of them. 23 primates consume mushrooms and they go back a long way in our um, evolutionary tree. There's 5 million species of fungi. They outnumber plants 10 to 1. And 30% of the soil mass is made up of fungal mass. Some of it living, some of it dead. It's the biggest repository of carbon in the world. Yeah? Um, and for every metre of tree root, there's a kilometre of the mycorrhizal network. And, you know, I've spoke about the mycorrhizal network before. It's how trees communicate and pass nutrients and chemicals around. Mycorrhizal chemicals. Cowboy Yet I learnt all about it from a TED Talk video A mycorrhizal cowboy Picking fungus and toadstools to cook at home on me hob And mushrooms that look like a knob And we separated on the evolutionary path um, humans and fungus, or, you know, things that became humans, 650 million years ago. And we are actually descendants of fungi. And we share more common ancestors with fungi and with any other kingdom out there. Um, under a microscope, animal cells, human cells and fungal cells are very similar. And there's other, there's other similarities. The mycelial networks are not dissimilar to our own brain's neural networks. Um, and fungal networks are the foundations of the food web. And he believes, it's one of his hypotheses, that they actually create the flora and fauna that then feed the insects and the animals that then rot down and feed the fungi. In fact, rather than me going on, I'm going to let him explain it. This really strongly supports the concept. This is the hypothesis with quickly becoming a theory. Uh, I'll explain the difference in a minute. Um, but this really supports the concept that I've uh, long believed and espoused, that these mycelial networks are they're not just happenstance they are just they're creating the habitats and the flora and then ultimately the fauna um, that are resident within the ecosystem to guarantee the plurality and the biodiversity of the ecosystem by creating the plants that create that grow up that feed the animals the insects to create the debris fields and then feed the mycelium for the benefit of the progeny of the mushrooms that will form thereafter so these are deterministic organisms that are setting the stage for ecological evolution and you think that they're doing this in a conscious manner well see again we're a victim of our consciousness trying to define what is conscious right. and what is smart. And one of the best arguments I've had, my brother Bill is a super genius, is far smarter than, than myself. And um, he was editing one of my books, Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World. And, and he goes, Paul, you cannot say that mycelium is, is, is intelligent. And then he says, you can't say nature is intelligent. And I go, wait, listen, Bill, I respect you. But you didn't realize the hypocrisy of the statement that you're giving me? You're telling me nature is not intelligent, and yet you are born of nature using the mind to conceive the concept to challenge the idea that nature is not intelligent when you are part of nature. Wow, so the hypothesis is that the fungus is a conscious being that creates the biome um, about it to sustain it. I know, this, I'll play you a bit more. This is really interesting. Thank you, yes. You know, we you know, language is code, mm. and we don't have, we haven't elaborated the code yet to elucidate the concepts that we're trying to articulate. That does not mean, uh, just because you can't prove it's true doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Right. Uh, so as our vocabulary increases, you know, as our lexicon of language increases, it becomes more robust, then I think we can better, better describe, test, and, uh, and prove that these concepts are true. But, we, you know, we're biologically provincial. Uh, when we think about how limited we are, we're truly new, you know, Neanderthals with nuclear weapons. I mean, this is when you look at the how 
how important natural ecosystems are, try to replicate them. They're very, very difficult to replicate due to their complexity. So I think the more that we study nature, most all of us scientists uh, subscribe to the adage that the more we study the subject, the more we realize we didn't know. And the hubris of us thinking that these things cannot occur, did not occur, will not occur, really speaks to our provincial uh, attitude towards nature. So there you go, the largest living organism, I nearly said orgasm then, the largest living organism in the world is a mycelial mat that's 2,200 acres in size. And and it's a honey mushroom, 2,200 acres in size, yep. So basically, um, this is the argument, fungus creates a landscape that we exist in and it creates it for their own ends. They are, basically, they are our overlords, so I think we should bow down to our mushroom cods. (laughs) Whoa, dude, that's far out, man. My mind unravels like a toilet bowl In the deepest secrets of our souls And won't somebody please think of the flowers They're talking to me saying We are your friends Right, well, I think that'll do for one week. Hopefully, we'll have Len back with us next time. Um, remember, these are available on YouTube, also on Podium, and on um, wherever. I don't know. I don't know where it actually comes out. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the show. Thank you once again for listening, and I will see you soon. Bye. The Big Blog.